All right, we're ready to go. Um, I want to start with, this is a, a, a interactive tasting. We want participation. So uh, everybody speak up whenever you want to. You're unmuted now. And you can, we're going to stay unmuted. Just watch out. Don't step on somebody else when you're talking. But, but uh, feel free to speak up, ask questions, or make comments. We are delighted to have them. We're going to try to get through this in an hour. <laughs> and there's a lot to unpack here. So um, if you, we're going to try to get to the t actual discussion of the wines about 7.30 or 7.40. So keep that in mind, your questions. During that time, questions are absolutely uh, all welcome, but if you need to ask a question, just ask the question. Okay, okay, all right. Voulez-vous aller au Bordeaux of Vecmois ce soir? For all of you who know French in that rough uh, tra uh, language just then, you know what it means. It's would you like to go to Bordeaux uh, with me this evening? And so, what's the answer? Absolutely. Speak up, yes. Everybody we, want to we, 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 we. All right, there we go. We're getting some interactivity now. Now you you see that we have Thirsty uh, Scott Jones, Thirsty, with us tonight. We're very lucky to have him again with us. He's an esteemed expert in uh, all things wine. And uh, Thirsty, we want to thank you for being with us this evening. And Sarah's going to take care of all our technical problems as she has just done. So <laughs> we're, we're underway. So here we go. Uh, Thirsty, tell us about why and how you got into wine for openers, if you would. That's a great question, uh, Ed. And uh, I feel like um, we're, uh, it's like a Smokey and the Bandit part two with all the wines and all the information we have to cover. We have a long way to go and a short time to get there. So, um, I don't know, uh, maybe I'll be Bandit, you can be Smokey, uh, but uh, we, we, we should have fun. Um, yeah, so the, uh, the Jones is Thirsty thing. So uh, I, I, I didn't grow up in a house where we drank wine. I didn't have wine until um, I got to college, um, but I was um, always a history buff and, um, and, and got into wine uh, through my love of history. When I realized I could uh, learn about world history and learn about wine, well, it started to connect a little bit. So uh, in college, I studied uh, magazine publishing and journalism at the University of Mississippi. And, um, and then after college, um, worked for a while and then went to the Culinary Institute of America up in Hyde Park and got a culinary arts degree uh, because I really wanted to leverage my passion for um, media with my passion for food and wine. And I cooked in restaurants, uh, all through college and just loved it. Um, and when I was at the CIA, that's where I really, things started to click. Uh, part of the, the two and a half year curriculum there is a, is a pretty deep dive uh, into, uh, into wine and, and uh, it uh, just made sense and uh, I just loved it. Uh, so I worked uh, at Food and Wine Magazine uh, for a while and then moved to Birmingham and worked at Southern Living Magazine. And, uh, and while I was at Southern Living, I started to, uh, uh, began to kind of dabble in, in teaching people about wine and uh, something I really love to do. Um, I didn't want to sell wine. I didn't want to be necessarily on the business side of wine, but I love teaching people about wine. So um, in uh, 2011, I, um, at the urging of my kids, uh, I decided to uh, launch Jones is Thirsty as a, as a proper wine education company. Um, and so since then, I've traveled around the country and still do it today, and uh, primarily partnering with businesses and doing uh, wine education uh, seminars all around what I call my no snobbery wine education. So I work very hard to strip out all of the, you know, unnecessary wine speak. I like to meet people where they are. Um, it's really all about teaching people uh, to enjoy wine, to buy with confidence, to enjoy with confidence, whether they're with clients or they're with their spouse or they're at a restaurant. It's just really helping them to put a few things in their toolbox outside of the norm. And uh, I, I love doing it and, and um, it's been a blast. Um, I work with attorneys, doctors, financial planners, you name it, run the gamut. And um, that of course led to doing more private in-home uh, events. Um, but behind all of this, the underpinnings of this, which is the important part, which is, um, 
launching Jones is Thirsty obviously had the thirsty, haha, we're all thirsty, we love to drink wine, but it also had a philanthropic element. So everything I've done since day one has been um, to come alongside uh, a charitable uh, organization. For the first few years, it was never thirst. Um, so I was connecting thirst to thirst. I've since um, branched out to work with just about every, um, uh, every uh, organization in Birmingham, because uh, I love to, to use wine and fun and education to help raise money. But I do a lot of work with uh, pediatric cancer foundations. And, and uh, so that's, that's what happens. Um, I do that now. Um, I, I just love to go in and kind of pour out my knowledge. Um, I, I totally agnostic when it comes to wine. I love wines from all over, but uh, we can either talk about these fine Bordeaux or we can talk about the finer points of Southern Home White Zinfandel. Doesn't make any difference to me. I just want people to feel comfortable and confident. So that's really um, how I got into Jones's Thirsty, and that's what I do today. That's your story, and you're sticking to it, huh? That's right. That's right. Okay. Well, thank you for being here, and you've been a great help to us, Scott, and we really appreciate you. Uh, speaking of appreciation, I want you to know that uh, tonight we have over 100 people, uh, we think, online, uh, which is fantastic. We turned down 20 to 40 people today because they came in too late to get the wine, and we, we sold, uh, sold out uh, completely, so we had to turn down 20 or 40. And the credit to this incredible increase in our uh, participation tonight belongs to two ladies who are on, uh, one Carol Ann Roberts uh, and Joy Close, both of who are on tonight. They have blogs. They were kind enough to blog to their friends about us, and apparently it's had an incredibly positive effect. So thank you, ladies, very much for that. And uh, thank you all, all you attendees, for being here. This is uh, just wonderful from our point of view. So um, to get into it and not take any more of your time on trivia, uh, the game plan tonight is to give you a high-level uh, introduction to Bordeaux and the differences between the left and right banks. We'll talk about why they're called that in just a moment. And to, um, um, to give you uh, some significant differences between the two and then have some wines from both sides of the river. Uh, and then we'll talk about that. So that's the plan. And we'll, as I say, we'll try to get to the wine uh, by, by 7.30. Now, I don't, I mean, get to talking about the wine. <laughs> I expect you all are into the wine and probably have been before I got to start. So uh, that's a good thing. And one last thing, remember, you don't have to drink it all. These wines are young. You put a stopper in them. You can put them in your refrigerator. They'll be better tomorrow as long as you give them a little time to get warmed up. So um, you don't have to have all of it, but you don't, don't have to save either. Whatever works for you. So um, I think the first slide is a picture of Bordeaux. Uh, Sarah, is that right? Yeah. Okay. So we have uh, Bordeaux. This is a, a picture, big picture of it. Um, we talk about the left and right bank because you see this river in the middle, uh, well, the Gironde estuary. It's uh, sometimes called the Gironde River uh, because it's an estuary from a geographic point of view because the water flows from the Atlantic Ocean in and out but it's a lot of people call it the river and you can see it's made up of the confluence of two rivers down about midway down uh, the uh, Garonne and the Dorjone uh, coming together right above the town of Bordeaux turning into the Gironde River or estuary so obviously on the left or the left bank are the wines that are shown on the left and on the right are wines that are considered to be right bank wines. Now you will quickly notice, of course, that the left bank only goes down so far, and then it changes into a different river, and the right bank does as well, but it's still wines referred to coming from the left bank uh, or the right bank. Um, and we'll be talking tonight, of uh, drinking tonight, you're already drinking tonight, wines from the Haute Medoc, uh, highlighted here on the map, and Lestrock Medoc, two wines that are coming from the left bank. And on the right bank, we have two wines coming from Saint Emilion, um, and uh, that they're coming from uh, from Pomerol, the little, little, can you see Pomerol? See the highlighted Pomerol, a little dot down there is for, for Pomerol, and Saint Emilion's a larger area uh, right there that Sarah's uh, pointing at right now. 
So um, that's where the wine comes from. Left bank, right bank is the is the deal tonight. So um, that's that's kind of the big picture. And uh, we can now, if you go to the left bank, Sarah, if you will. The left bank um, wines, uh, they are along the river um, and um, they are from little towns or villages or communes, they call them, like St. Estef, Saint-Julien, Margot, and Pauillac um, on the right. Uh, they show you where they are on the map. Um, you will notice that uh, Saint-Julien and Pauillac are really close to the river. And typically those wines are among the best of the area because they are on gravelly uh, soil, uh, riverfront kind of gravel uh, put down eons ago and drain very well. So that's, uh, we'll talk more about that in a minute, but that's, that's their situation. Listrac and Mouilly uh, are a little further away from the river um, and so are some of the other ones they, they produce perhaps not quite as uh, celebrated wines. On this slide you'll notice the uh, 1855 uh, classification in the Madoc. The Madoc is this area on the left, Sarah, this up and down. This, this is the Madoc Peninsula down to about Bordeaux which is shown again on your map. No, not on this map, but it's down here. There, there you go. Down here slightly below where Margot is on the, on the, on the smaller map. That's the um, Madoc Peninsula. People talk about Madoc and it's, it, that covers the whole area uh, when you use that term like that. So um, the wines from the uh, left bank, um, gotta get my notes here straight, uh, um, are, um, uh, were classified in 1855 by the uh, wine trade at that time. So the history is, you might remember back that Thomas Jefferson, in fact, was drinking Bordeaux wines all the way back in 1784 he, when he was the ambassador to France. He began to enjoy French wines and imported them back to the U.S. and in fact introduced his friend George Washington to French wines. Um, and then he went home to become, of course, president and the Shortly after he left in uh, 1789, the French Revolution broke out and lasted uh, in various stages all the way to uh, about uh, the late 90s or so uh, of that time period. After that, uh, as you also know, Napoleon was engaged in a variety of wars and the, the English and French and other parts of uh, Europe fought for a number of years, a number of decades. And things kind of quieted down in about 1850 and France began to flower again. And so Napoleon the Third, in eighteen or about eighteen fifty-four, decided he wanted to have a grand exposition to celebrate France's uh, uh, rising. Um, uh, England had had one a couple of years before. It was called the Great uh, Exposition, I believe. And and so Napoleon wanted to have the Universal Exposition. And as such, the Bordeaux merchants, you know, wanted to be in, in this exposition. They wanted to have their wines uh, displayed. And so they had a marketing genius of some kind, I guess, uh, who decided they had to have some way to describe all these wines and classify them. So they decided they would classify the major wines in, uh, in the left bank, on the left bank. And um, they <laughs> tried for months and months to come to an agreement among a few hundred different wine uh, chateau as to who was going to get to be on this list and they did not make any progress doing that. So they decided to turn it over to the brokers or merchants who had the records of who had sold the most wine and who was getting the highest prices for their wine. And they allowed these merchants to, uh, to do the classification of first, second, third, fourth, and fifth growths, they called them, uh, primary crew, second crew, and so on, for five different levels. You see on this map, actually, you can see on over there on the right, Pauillac, Lafitte Rothschild, a name you undoubtedly heard of, and Mouton Rothschild, uh, well, Lafitte anyway, was uh, granted uh, first crew status, was, was the premier crew. Others were rated second, third, fourth, and fifth, as you can see on the map. Well, um, that w worked for the exposition and it worked for a few years, but basically it hasn't changed since 1855, which is a problem because 
A lot of Chateau have done better. A lot of Chateau have done worse. If you ranked them today, half of them would be gone from uh, as far as quality is concerned. Uh, others that were not ranked or, uh, would be elevated to these higher status. Uh, it's a rigid system. In fact, since 1855, only one Chateau has gone up, and that's Mouton, which has gone from second to first, and it took uh, 120 years for Mouton to get there. So it's a, it's a bit of a problem uh, as far as telling you what the real quality is on the left bank. Some of these wines that you see here are fantastic and have been fantastic a lot of the time. Some of them have had their ups and downs. Some of them don't deserve to be listed, as I said, uh, and many more, particularly some that Scott's going to talk a lot about that, are, that come from the right bank, deserve to be among the very top uh, chateau produced. So um, that's just kind of what, where it is. It gives you some idea of, the, um, of what uh, took place and also what some, some wines with the quality level of some of these wines. But your wine merchant can tell you which ones are better and which ones <laughs> are, are not as good. So uh, be sure and ask questions. Um, and I will remind you that the more specific the location, you know, the French believe in terroir, which is all about location and, and place name. So the more specific the, the designation of the property from which the wine comes, generally speaking, the higher quality, the higher value uh, that you get uh, for your money there. So, so that's, a, that's a quick overview of the left bank's uh, uh, geography. Uh, I'm going fast because I want to be sure we get to the wine. But uh, any, let me stop and say, ask if you have any, anybody have any questions they'd like to ask. At, at this point, or comments. I'm sure David Foster, sometimes known as Gramps, uh, knows a great deal about this sort of thing and would love to tell us something about his experiences with Bordeaux. Gramps. I have consumed many enjoyable bottles of Bordeaux. There you go. Great comment. <laughs> Perfect. Um, okay, um, next slide, please, ma'am. Okay, this is, as it says, a real Bordeaux Chateau. On the left bank, oops, on the left bank, you have these grand chateaux. You have a lot of forest land um, and you have a lot of uh, not very attractive land in between these grand chateaus. You can be driving along, a, appears to be a virtual country road, two lane road, uh, the, the vine route. <laughs> And, um, and all of a sudden, burst in front of you is this incredible chateau that's just unbelievably beautiful. Um, and what happened was after the French Revolution, and, and, or during the French Revolution, the uh, revolutionaries uh, guillotined a lot of the owners of the chateau. Uh, but after the revolution had passed and the, and the, the dark period had passed, the wealthy, wealthy French Parisians came down to Bordeaux and bought a lot of the chateau. So that redistribution of wealth didn't work quite like the revolution intended, like it did in, in Burgundy. But anyway, you ended up with these grand chateaux in, in Burgundy, I mean Bordeaux. And I do want to take just one minute to tell you about going to one of these and compare it for a moment to going to a winemaker in Burgundy. You heard uh, the week about what it's like to go to a Burgundian winemaker where you knock on a door and some gruff guy who does not want to speak French comes to it and it's an interesting experience. It's totally different in Bordeaux, in the left bank anyway. You, you go to a chateau like this, and like Chateau Montrose, you knock on the door and this uh, well-dressed, uh, well-groomed young person comes to the door and speaks excellent English and already knows who you are and you're right on time and come on in Mr. And Ms. Finch and uh, they take you into a waiting room. Now we've all been to waiting rooms but I'm not talking about a waiting room like you've ever imagined. This is a waiting room that's opulent. It's got Chagall on the walls and, and Cezanne and it's got Louis the 14th antiques or my wife would probably say they were Louis the 17th but that's all I know. Anyway, it's fantastic uh, art and antiques and beauty and, and, you know, you're just overwhelmed by this palatial 
uh, opulence. And um, so you, they let you wait long enough to be uh, suitably impressed. And uh, they, then they come get you. And so we're walking down the large corridor towards uh, with our, our host. It's a different person. One person greets you, one person takes you around. And I look down the hall and I see this huge room at the end. And I can see that there's this big table and there are 10 sets of 20, 25 glasses of wine already poured. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I've stumbled into something again. This is going to be fantastic. And, um, and there's a, so all kinds of people around, one guy in a three-piece suit looking very natty. And um, we're walking along and I, I guess the uh, our host um, recognized that I was being overwhelmed by what was getting ready, I thought, to happen to us. <clears throat> and um, he said, oh no, monsieur, you're not going there. <laughs> You're, you're going over here. That is Monsieur uh, Roland. And Monsieur Roland is the uh, leading consultant, wine consultant in Bordeaux. I mean, he is like, he's like unbelievable. He's the number one guy. He knows everything. He, so uh, I'm, I'm, that's incredible. There's Monsieur Roland. We see him there. And, and he's come to select the blends for the vintage. And, and they're going to be, all these people around, he's going to tell them, how to blend their wine at this chateau, which, what, how much Merlot to put in it, which part of the vineyard that's Merlot to put in it, and so on and on and on. Uh, so th that's the sort of thing you, you, you do get to see. And uh, then you get a, you get a tour of, you know, of, of that sort of place and it's uh, incredible. And you get to go to the cellars and perhaps, and, uh, and um, uh, see the, the barrels and thousands of bar barrels in the, and the fermentation tanks. And, uh, and then they'll, give you a, a, a treat some wine very young Bordeaux very young Bordeaux and they don't you know that's what you're going to get uh, and a young Bordeaux these are somewhat young that we have tonight but you know I'm talking about right out of the barrel kind of Bordeaux that's just uh, quite frankly uh, difficult for an amateur like me to have much appreciation for but it's a fun experience very different from Burgundy um, as I told you so that's uh, what the chateaus look like, and that's what your experience can be um, in the chateaus there. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the um, Left Bank uh, wines. Uh, and first, I'll tell you again about to mention the geology. There's gravel close to the river. It peters out as it goes further to, into the uh, interior where there's more clay. And um, that, that's important because the grapes that grow in, in, uh, in Bordeaux, some of them, Cabernet Sauvignon likes more gravel, Merlot likes more clay. So you have, you have a blend in, the, in that part on the left bank and um, it's, it's a function of the terroir or the, or the uh, actual geology. And, and what makes that important is that, that the grapes that are grown there, some of them, they like gravel, more gravel than others that like more clay. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But in, in addition to geology uh, in the on the left bank, you have weather being a significant factor. It's a coastal area. If you remember back to that slide we showed you of Bordeaux, that blue, uh, yeah, that blue over here is the Atlantic Ocean. So you're getting a, a coastal weather here. And that is, uh, you know, f reasonably far north, you're getting some cold and wet uh, winters uh, and springs and uh, variable weather in the fall and um, and the grapes ripen at different times and it, it creates an element of chance in for the Bordeaux uh, producers. Uh, three, and generally speaking over the last 40 or 50 years, three out of every 10 years the weather uh, is bad uh, they, they, and the, particularly the Cabernet Sauvignon grape does not ripen as well. Now, you can imagine that um, you've got, uh, uh, you've got, uh, I'm sorry, my, my assistant is telling me I got to hurry up. So uh, you've got, uh, you've got your, your whole year's work sitting out there in the vineyard and you're trying to decide whether it's going to have a hailstorm or thunder and, dr and, and rain like heck or whether to take them in. You know they need another day or two. It's just a really big time gamble, and, and that's what they face. Um, so uh, quickly, the the uh, on the in the left on the left bank, the primary grape is the Cabernet Sauvignon grape, um, and it 
get, you get about uh, 60, 75 percent is uh, Cabernet Sauvignon and uh, 20 percent or so is Merlot and the rest is a couple of other grapes. Cabernet Franc uh, is, a, is a grape that's sometimes utilized and Petit Verdot in, in lesser qu quantities today like you know one, two, three, four percent is Petit Verdot, maybe up to 10 for Cabernet Franc. There's a fifth grape that was used a long time ago, and I don't know anybody that uses it today, Malbec, which you know about from Argentina. Uh, but that's the, um, that's the story on the left side. I'm gonna to stick to that and let Thirsty tell us about the right bank. Okay. Uh, well, uh, let me share my screen here and uh, I'll uh, try and uh, keep this brief, but I do wanna uh, point out some things that um, that will uh, continue to build on uh, what Ed was saying, uh, just in terms of overall terroir. Um, once you get over to uh, the right side, you still have that maritime climate, but here's the deal. Um, you know, over on the uh, right side, it's uh, all about uh, the clay. And we'll, we'll talk about that relative to uh, particularly Pomerol, uh, but also uh, St. Uh, Emilion, uh, but, but there, um, it's ideal for Merlot. Uh, they, it's a late ripening grape, totally different than Cabernet Sauvignon. And, uh, you know, that, that clay retains water. And uh, when you get the hot, dry uh, summers, um, the, the Merlot are able to um, really put down those, those deep roots that are allowed to tap into some of that water. Um, the other thing that we haven't talked about, I just want to mention it quickly, is that uh, between the two rivers is this, uh, this area called uh, Entre de Mer, which is like, you know, in between the two seas, but the two rivers. Um, we're not gonna talk about that tonight. Uh, we're gonna save that for another night. I just need you to know that uh, that's a, a more alluvian soil. It's a, it's a delta and uh, the soil is real fertile there. And uh, if you've been around Finch or Jones is Thirsty for any length of time, what you know about grapes is um, you got to stress them out. They don't like, they don't flourish uh, when the soil is real fertile. They like, um, they like soil where they got to work hard. So um, the Entre de Mer uh, is known for a lot of things, mostly um, white wines uh, and um, some um, kind of more uh, value inexpensive, um, more village and uh, local level reds and rosés. Um, but the thing is, is in that area, there's a, um, another river, a little tributary, uh, the Ciron. And uh, the thing about the Ciron is it's near uh, um, a, a region um, down there about uh, around Sauterne. Um, and uh, the humidity from that river causes something called botrytis. Again, we don't have time to go into it tonight, but that noble rot um, creates some of the most um, uh, amazing dessert wines uh, that you will um, you'll ever have. And this is really ground zero for the world's finest um, uh, dessert wines that are based on Simeon. Uh, so in that area, the white grapes are uh, primarily uh, Sauvignon Blanc and Simeon and another Muscadel, but Simeon is the, is the rock star there. And if you've ever heard of, a, of a, one of those um, first growth Premier Cru wine, Chateau Akim, that's where that, that, um, that wine is found. So for another day, but just want to include that. Um, and as, um, as Ed mentioned, um, you know, left um, bank is um, cab. So you've got um, those more muscular, I guess, kind of masculine style over on the right bank where it's primarily uh, Merlot and Cab Franc. Those are the two big blends, but really that's where Merlot is, is king. You have a much different style of wine there uh, because of the grape, but also because of the terroir, which we'll talk about uh, when we, when the, you, you, just, you see it in these wines. Um, so um, again, just want you to know, you've got you know, those sweet Simeon-based wines down there in the Entre de Mer. Um, going to the next slide, this is um, kind of piggybacking on the slide that we saw with Ed, but again, I want to give you a, a quick helicopter ride over um, the right bank. So you can see that landmass is, is, is significant. Um, but what we're going to uh, really focus in on is this little uh, black dot here is um, the city of Libourne. And that's uh, basically the capital, if you will, 
at least the economic capital of the right bank. And so uh, the important part is of this, um, you, you see the, the map to uh, the right is the Libournais is the area that we're gonna concentrate on. Um, you could spend a lifetime learning about the left bank. You can spend a lifetime learning about the right bank. And actually, um, I, I had to pull out uh, my, um, this is my Bordeaux atlas uh, that uh, the late Michael Bod Broadbrent um, uh, was the part of, and, and uh, Mr. Bod Broadbrent passed away uh, recently. But um, I mean, you can go as deep as you want, but um, these areas of Pomerol and St. Emilion are the places that we'll focus on. Um, but what I also wanted to show you is that um, the first wine that we'll uh, have from the right bank is from a chateau called uh, Chateau Vaugère. And uh, Chateau Vaugère makes amazing wines from St. Emilion. Um, but if you'll notice, um, there's a, a, an appellation uh, called the Cote de Bordeaux. And it kind of pulls together some of these outlying uh, viticultural areas, and they've banded together to have their own AOC. So it's a recognized um, appellation. And uh, just uh, budding up to um, St. Emilion, and you can see it actually much better over here with my little hand drawn uh, artwork here, but you have the um, Castillon. And so that's part of the broader. Cote de Bordeaux. And so this wine that we'll be having is, um, and Ed can speak to this because he's actually experienced this, but you have this very, um, um, you know, you know, renowned area like uh, Saint Emilion, and then literally budding right up to it is Castillon. And so the grapes that we'll have are sourced from um, literally like, think about it right across the street. As I was <laughs> getting ready for tonight, I was thinking like when my wife and I moved to LA, um, this is what a realtor would call a Beverly Hills adjacent. And so um, like your parents would come to visit and they'd be like, oh my goodness, you live in such a, this is such a great house. And look, Beverly Hills is right down the road. This is phenomenal. And you're like, yeah, yeah, you know, you're right. You get the best of both worlds. You get value, but you get uh, proximity to this really wonderful area. And this um, uh, Cap de Vergere, is a, a, a perfect example of, of a wine that is, um, um, you know, really has this amazing pedigree. Um, the other thing I want you to know is that, um, is that in, um, over on the, um, uh, the right bank, there are these St. Emilian satellites. And so I've highlighted those here. You can definitely dig into it um, uh, as you have time. But in terms of overall um, presence of the grapes, um, I did a little chart down here at the bottom you can see how dominant Merlot is throughout all of Bordeaux. So um, 164 acres currently devoted uh, to Merlot. And um, while it dominates the right, it's also part of the blend on the left. So um, you can see how they fall after that with Cab Sauvignon, Cab Franc. And then um, just to put a, a, like a fine dot on the point about the kind of the, the um, the blending grapes, if you will, that Ed was talking about, a total of 3,000 acres is devoted to Carmenere, Petit Verdot, Malbec. So they all are, you know, little micro percentages to add structure, flavor, uh, tannin, whatever, uh, you know, a, a wine might, might need to, you know, round out um, kind of the, you know, the palate. Um, and, um, you know, I guess in terms of the, the areas that we'll concentrate on tonight, like I said, it's really all about uh, St. Emilion and Pomerol. And the one thing that I did want to say for those of you who joined us on the Burgundy uh, tasting, um, Burgundy, all about sense of place. They're primarily working with two grapes there. You're either making wine with Pinot Noir, you're making wine with Chardonnay. Totally different in Bordeaux. Yes, it's all about a sense of place, but they're blending grapes there. This is um, a totally different proposition. These guys are, are and these men and women that are winemakers are, you know, they're, they're going deep on the sense of place, but man, they're working magic uh, once these vintages have come in and they're, and they're crafting these blends. So much different um, style of winemaking than you might find in, in, um, in Burgundy. Um, 
uh, you know, not to be outdone um, by, uh, you know, a hundred years or so. Uh, while the, while everyone was fussing about uh, the Medoc um, in the 1855 classification, um, in the 1950s, uh, they decided um, that the right needed a little bit of love. So they um, came in and uh, created a classification um, uh, in, in uh, St. Emilion. Uh, where they did tried to do the same thing, identify um, uh, important terroir um, uh, chateau that were making important wines. And so uh, from that uh, 1954 uh, to 2012, um, they have uh, identified four Premier Grand Cru Classe A. So that's um, uh, the equivalent over on the left of a Premier Cru First Growth. So there are four wineries that I, you may have heard of. These are uh, very famous, just like you'd get over um, uh, in the Medoc, but um, Chateau uh, Angelou's is, you know, world renowned, but that's uh, one of them. You have Chateau Asson, Chateau Cheval Blanc. If you've seen Sideways, that was the wine that he, he dreamed of, and you have uh, uh, Chateau Pavé. So um, those are the four um, kind of class A, and then they have a class B, still fantastic, another uh, 10 wines under that. So there are 14 in total that fall under that Premier Grand Cru um, level. And then they have about 50 that come in a tier below that. But on the right bank, that's the only classification that exists. Now, as Ed will be quick to tell you, um, classification over on the right bank is a good thing, but it doesn't mean anything in many ways because Pomerol which has no official classification, is home to some of the world's best wines. And as he alluded to earlier, would stand up to any of the first rows in many ways, maybe in some years better uh, than some of those Premier Crus. So in Pomerol, where there is no classification, you have Chateau Petrus, you have uh, Chateau Le Fleur, Le Pen, um, you have uh, Chateau uh, Conscient, you have all these famous kind of cult wines that people, um, you know, these are the wines you see, you know, people at, um, you know, Christie's and Sotheby's, you know, paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for these wines. But um, just know that, um, you know, classification is a good thing. But like uh, Ed said, it's, it's, um, it's, it's not everything. Um, the other thing about Pomerol, and he mentioned uh, Michel Roland, uh, that's where uh, Michel Roland is from. And, you um, He's kind of a winemaker to the stars. You'll hear his name associated with wines all over the world, from South America, all over Europe. I mean, the guy is, I don't know how he does it. Um, and as it relates to our wines tonight, uh, particularly that, um, that uh, uh, Thai Affair, um, the 2015 Chateau Thai Affair, um, Pomerol is kind of, you can see my hands, it comes up on a plateau, okay? And those are three distinct uh, terroirs. The most prestigious is the top of that plateau, which is where that uh, Chateau uh, Thai Affair comes from. But up there, they have this unique blue clay, and it really is blue. I mean, there's, there's uh, veins of it, um, kind of, I think you can find it um, in the west of America. Uh, there's, but but um, while it drives uh, commercial real estate folks crazy because it's uh, a nightmare to work with, when it comes to growing world-class Merlot and Cabernet Franc, Merlot particularly, blue, blue clay is, is everything. It is the pixie dust that's sprinkled all over Pomerol. And you combine that with some of that limestone, and it is, um, I mean, it's just such an amazing uh, little uh, microclimate of, um, of viticulture there. So, um, again, we could go all night about this, but um, just know that, um, it's really, you, you know, there are lots of great wines, but it's about kind of that Pomerol area and that St. Emilia. Okay, um, Coach, back over to you. Yeah, th thank you. And, and that's, uh, that was great. And, and both uh, Thirsty and I hate to take such a short uh, look at these things because it, it is complicated and there's a lot to uh, uh, tell you about. And, and we could talk uh, uh, for hours about just a microscopic part of it, but but uh, Thirsty has, has summarized uh, the two areas. You note on his map, I'll just make one, one point, on his map, this Cote de Castillon, as he's got down there on the right, 
is where the Cap Forger comes from. Literally, on the other side of that line is yeah. Forger. That's yeah. that's the Papa uh, Chateau of, of Cap uh, Forger. And they go for different prices, and they're just across the street, like he says. And it's just uh, Fougere years ago decided they'd make sort of a second wine, and they just picked that spot. And, um, and and that's what goes on in Bordeaux. Many many chateau have second, third iterations of their wine. Um, yeah. And it's it just makes it all the more complicated, but wonderful. You get great stuff like this this Cap Fougere, which I think is terrific. Absolutely. I would say for, for mortals like us, um, those are the things, you know, I would say candidly, um, if, you've, if, you, if you like Bordeaux and you've kicked around Bordeaux, it's hard to find values in Bordeaux because it's everybody wants a Bordeaux. So you really got to, you got to dig deep. And this is one of those gems that I'm telling you, uh, Ed is exactly right. You can be drinking these wines uh, and getting, uh, you know, you're, you're, I mean, it's a it's a real gem. You're getting a, a taste of 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 what a you know a wine that would be multiples in terms of price, but uh, you you can you can have this on a Saturday night and no one's going to know any different. I mean, you're drinking a phenomenal wine. So I've let us get a little bit um, into the drinking hour. I hope you all have been drinking, and I'm sure you have as we've gone along. But uh, we I'd like to talk a little bit about it uh, as we go, and I. Uh, Thirsty, if you'd start with the with your right bank wines and just kind of give a description of quickly because we are already sure, sure, sure. out of time. I'll do a little bit on the left bank after you after you finish. Yeah, yeah. So we'll we'll like well, we'll start with that uh, the Cap de Bougere. So we have um, a 2015 and, and and also some of you might have a 2016. But uh, so you're getting uh, pretty young wines. They've got some age on it. But um, you know, as as Ed said, we don't have to beat it up. You're you're talking about a um, you know, a, a, a St. Emilion adjacent wine um, that's uh, mostly uh, uh, Merlot, about 85%. It's got a little Cab Franc in it and just a splash of, um, of uh, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. But um, what's really interesting to me is um, this is, um, this wine is just, the, 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 the nose just explodes uh, to me with, with fruit and it's just r real racy. Um, I, I get the sense that this is like a, what uh, you must have felt like seeing Walter Payton in high school. You knew that there, he was going to be great down the road, but right now it was just like a lot of raw energy, a lot of potential, but I'm sure it was a blast to watch him uh, run in high school too. And that's kind of the way I feel with this. But um, um, so we've got this um, uh, Cap de Bougere. Uh, we'll, we'll taste through it, but you'll get that, that real uh, ripe fruit nose, blueberries, um, some herbs, uh, and then we'll get to um, – uh, a more uh, kind of a, a in, as Ed said earlier, um, into a more an area of more specificity. So we'll have that um, tie affair and um, just a point of reference. Uh, this winery again, talk about a real gem. Uh, this winery is uh, owned by the Mouet family, and they're the family that owns Chateau Le Fleur. They own um, uh, Dominus and Napa. They have Napa Nook. I mean, these families, the family knows knows wine. Um, and it's also located on that, that uh, plateau. Again, about 85% Merlot, um, some Cab Franc in there, but you're really getting um, of this beautiful expression of, um, of, of Merlot and what it can do in its roundness, those tannins. But this is going to have, you know, more of that licorice and plum to me, but just, again, just explodes with uh, so much uh, wonderful fruit. So if somebody else want to comment on that one before we go before um, Thirsty goes on to the other one on the right bank. Anybody have a comment on the Cap Fougere that they'd like to, like to share? Cap Fougere to share? Um, just notice for those of you who have the 2015, just look at that color uh, just even now. Um, that's a, that's a, uh, and, and for those of you who have the 16 younger, uh, not quite as much extraction, but uh, this 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 2015 is just a really beautiful beautiful wine, very aromatic.
I know you're out there. Go ahead. Uh, Ed, or, or Thursday, either one. Uh, on the 2015, what, what do you think the aging possibilities are on this particular wine? Um, the 2016 vintage was uh, regarded as slightly better uh, from, from an aging point of view. Uh, the 2015 was viewed as one that could perhaps be approached more, more quickly and probably would not quite last as long. But they're good, um, you know, they're good uh, 10 plus more years from now. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Gramps, you've drunk as much old Bordeaux, Bordeaux as anybody. Uh, it just goes on and on, doesn't it? And, uh, it, it does. It just gets wonderful. So I, 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 not much difference, but maybe a little, little more to the 2016. Yeah, past right. that, pass that fruit, I mean, I, that acidity, you know, it's just going to help mm. uh, let these wines, you know, kind of mature in the bottle. They've had enough oak aging that, you know, it's going to, you know, some of those um, tannins will soften. Some of that will kind of fall out over the years and uh, that uh, acidity will kind of uh, soften a little bit and uh, should be delicious. That's good. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. Um, so, any more comments on the uh, right bank wines that anybody would like to make? What about food pairings? Oh. We always are, are all about food pairings as well, <laughs> so we're thinking, you know, what can we pair these wines with? So, what do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, I, I, th it's funny because I was thinking about that um, yesterday um, because I was uh, cooking a filet mignon and I thought, this, this kind of wine, this Merlot-based wine, to me would be great with uh, whether it was pan-seared or kind of oven-roasted, a filet with, a, with like a, uh, I don't know, it could, I'd love a, a blue cheese cream sauce over the top or uh, a pan sauce made with mushrooms. But I think the earthiness of the mushrooms uh, and the, 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 the kind of the richness of the tenderloin, but not so much fat that, you know, you, to me that's it. It's got an elegant dish that goes with an elegant wine. Um, man, I bet if we were lucky enough to have a, a, a hunk of uh, truffle as big as our fist, a uh, truffled risotto in this would be, would be great uh, as well. But, I, you know, for me, it would be a kind of a, a filet with a nice sauce with it would be dynamite to me. Yeah, this is Lynn and James Bradford. We thought the Fougere was great with our granola this morning for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> That's my kind of family. Yeah, James, you're starting the uh, uh, cocktail hour a little early there, buddy. During the lockdown, that's all you can do. So good for you, James yeah. and Lynn. I say good for you. Yeah. They were decanting. Extreme situations call for extreme measures. And That's right. That's right. <laughs> I think I saw Maida Finch trying to make a comment then. What'd you say, dear? Oh, I was just agreeing that Corona, I mean, you just drink when you need to drink. Mm. <laughs> Breakfast is fine. <laughs> and when you have three kids, yes. you need to drink all the alcohol. That's right. <laughs> even two, even two kids. <laughs> well, better than bleach. So, you know, drink the wine. I think. <laughs> So, yeah. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll take just a minute on the left bank and then just go back and forth. So the left bank wines are the 2010 uh, Bernadotte and the uh, 2016 Focas de Prix. Um, and uh, the uh, Bernadotte, Bernadotte is the old wine of this tasting. It was, it was the oldest uh, Bordeaux we had in the shop. I think it's showing very, very well. It's got uh, the tannins have kind of smoothed out and, and, and the fruit is just right there. It's a lacy. Um, it, uh, this, these wines here at the shop were opened at around five o'clock. So we're on to, uh, you know, almost three hours now. And when I first tasted this at six o'clock and smelled it, it was, um, it was really doing well, I thought. But in the last hour, this wine has just really improved for me in the glass. I mean, the black fruit is just coming through. The tannins are balanced. It's got a really good balance to it. Um, and um, uh, you know, I, I just think that's a, a good wine. I'm, I'm glad we, I'm glad we had it at the shop. We're sold out and can't get any more. You guys got it all, but um, uh, it's, it's a it's a good one. 
uh, the, the forecast Dupree is, um, has been around for a, a, a good while it's a, I mean, in terms of the Chateau. Um, and and, uh, and it, it, I like this one very much. Um, it comes from Mouly, I think, doesn't it? No, Listrock. Listrock, I guess it is. And, um, it, it, you know, um, uh, Janice Robinson describes it as a smoky black fruit. It's kind of got a little truffle to it as far as I'm concerned. Um, tannins are subtle and it's juicy uh, and I, I generous. I, this is a, another good bargain, uh, not well known, uh, that, uh, that like Thirsty was talking about, a real good bargain and uh, will last a good while, I believe. And I wanted to um, uh, tap in here um, that we've got the 2010 Bernadotte taste tonight. I get the gravel, I get cocoa, I get mushroom. And it's just, I think it is singing tonight. And I have had experience with a number of the Bernadottes. Oh, that's windy. And 15, several vintages. And I always think it's one of the best bargains. I mean, it's, it's a rock star. It really is. Uh, any other comments, uh, come on, folks, about what, what you taste, what you don't taste? You know, when you it's, taste it, it's, it's, it's interesting, Ed, that even in the hour, because we only decanted at about six, six. Yeah. and only in one hour, it, it's made yeah. a remarkable kind of difference in the taste, the smell, everything about the wine, even in a short hour. So I agree, it's really, it's really one of those wines, I think, that really opens as it's... I, you know, that's one of the takeaways I hope that everybody gets from, from the talks that we do and the tastes that we do. Red wine improves if you decant it and let it breathe a while. It can be yeah. two, three hours. I mean, for these young wines, it, it, they'll just get better. I promise you, you put corks in these wines and put them in your refrigerator at night, take them out tomorrow night, let it warm up to kind of cellar temperature 60 degrees, ago, and it will be better than it is tonight. Um, yeah. It, it just, they just do better with breathing. They're young, and they just they show wonderfully over time. Uh, Ed, one quick thing just to... Uh, uh, piggyback on what Wendy said about this being a great bargain. I, I agree that the other little uh, uh, little uh, trivial pursuit uh, question related to this wine is that um, so uh, you have Chateau Bernadotte, great wine, but the winemaker um, is uh, Hubert uh, de Bouard, who is the winemaker. His, his family is the family that runs Chateau Angelou's. So you have Again, it's like you get the, you get the man, man and, and he is kind of on par with like Michel Roland. I mean, he's, he's, I mean, I bet he consults with 50 or 60 wineries across the world, but um, this is one of, this is a wine, this is one of his wines. So you're getting this amazing winemaking know-how and someone who knows the fruit um, and, uh, you know, this just happens to be on the left bank, but I mean, they, they know how to make some wine over there. Um, I, I, what I, what I did notice is when I decanted this, I had a good bit of sediment already, uh, in my, in my bottle and I could even see it in the color of my wine with some of that, that tan, those tannins falling out, having more of that, um, that darker to go along. Ed, like you said, with that darker fruit, that color being not quite as bright and, and youthful, but having the, you know, some of those, that, that darker, richer, um, uh, look and, and the aroma and flavor, it's just, um, just dynamite. I saw um, Doug Eckert on here a minute ago. Doug, you're a Bordeaux guy. What do you? How do you like these wines? Which one do you like best? Come on here. I'm unmuted now, Ed. It took okay. a minute. Good. Technologically challenged, but I'd say <laughs> I'm actually uh, tending towards the right bank and more of the Merlot. So, uh, and and so we are with. The, I think we're the second set of two. So I'm uh, the Pomerol is the one that I'm drinking, yeah. and uh, fantastic. I really like it. We probably had it. We decanted it in the cellar, and it's probably been open for two hours now, mm -hmm. and it's getting better. Do you typically yeah. like the the right bank, Doug, or the left bank, or do you have any kind of preference? For I typically like the right bank. You do okay, good. Who else we, is willing to speak up? I think I see Shelby Mackey there ready to say something, right, Shelby? Yeah, Ed, um, 
I would say that which one I prefer depends on what my purpose is. I'm looking to just have an easy drinking wine out on the back porch. I'm probably going to go with the right bank. If I'm looking for something com more complex to pair with a, uh, a more elegant meal, I'm going to go with the left bank version. It's just two different things. They're both really good, but okay. different purposes. Yeah, the, the right, the, the left bank has a little, has, has the cap, more Cabernet Sauvignon generally. And they are typically more, a little more austere and elegant than that you find from the more forward fruit in the right bank that are more, uh, I don't know, hedonistic, uh, sexy mm -hmm. than, than, the, uh, than the left bank wines. Um, well, th thank you for that. Um, Anybody else would like to say something here? I know we got a lot of people, a lot of knowledgeable people here I see on, on, on hand. I like the left bank one. Good. Okay. You got a lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> I always like, I think, you know, I just like Cabernet more than I like um, Merlot. Okay. Wilson Finch is on too. How about it, Wilson? I like the, uh, the left bank as well. But maybe that's a genetic thing. And how about your <laughs> how about your roommate there? I uh, second that. Second that. Yeah, I've been enjoying it all night. And and what did uh, Bandit like? The dog. Uh, he liked the truffle fries I gave him and the beef dog. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> we should be a dog, right? Yeah. No kidding. Uh, uh, and some I'm looking at a comment now. They're looking at the 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 blend on the. Uh, the Bernadotte, it's um, 50, about 52% Cab, 48% Merlot, I think is what, uh, is what the 2010 vintage was, but it's always going to lean more Cab uh, anyway. Okay. I think it's also hard to compare them, for me at least, because I can tell that the, um, uh, the right bank is younger. And... Mm -hmm. I just like them to be a little more mature. So I think that, you know, I might like the um, Cap de, how do you say Fougier. it? Fougier. Yeah, yeah, in a few more. You know, I might like that one a little bit more when it gets a little bit older. You just had a lot of old Bordeaux. <laughs> that is not my fault. Uh, you know, another thing, Ed, I mentioned this to Wendy today when I saw her in the shop. Um, I was really uh, taken by the alcohol content of all of these wines. So all of the wines, except the Fourcade, which is 13%, all the other wines are 14.5%. I mean, those are some, some, some big boys. Uh, those, those, are, those, are, yeah. those are big wines, for sure. Uh, depending on, you know, whether they're left bank or right bank, even that, you know, so they're, they're getting the right kind of ripeness that can deliver, uh, you know, not only the structure, but the alcohol as well. As well. Uh, Barbara Gower, uh, one of our faithful uh, uh, attendees is here again tonight. Thank you, Barbara. Um, what, what about you? You have a comment or a question? But mostly well, you course, ask a great question. I definitely do have comments. I, well, I was gonna comment on mouthfeel in addition to taste because I, that to me is a big deal. I tend not to like the silkier wines. And what I've noticed is that the left bank is more sort of an aggressive, assertive, astringent wine. Not really, but more yeah, so. More way. so, yep. And then the right bank is more silky. So I'm not a silky person. So that, that's why I say I'm a left bank girl. I definitely like that. But I also think Susan made an interesting comment a few weeks ago about tasters versus non-tasters, which probably you all did this experiment in the biology class at some point. You either taste that piece of paper or you don't. So I like a hoppy IPA, and I also like a, board, a um, Cabernet Sauvignon. And I think probably all of us are tasting totally different things. You know, I, I don't taste the subtleties that other people taste in wines, and I like that kind of over-the-top taste. And that's just, it's a genetic thing. Well, you brought up a very important point, and that is that we all taste differently. We all have different experiences. No, any comment is welcome and is not never wrong. It's just all, it can be different. Uh, I love reading some of these wine writers who write about some of these wines. And I'm thinking, what in the world are you talking about? 
this is, it, and sometimes they even contradict themselves in what they're saying. It's just remarkable. Yeah. Uh, they must be making a fortune and I'm in the wrong business, but, <laughs> but, um, you know, any, you can't be wrong about it. You just have preferences and, and what's important though is I think is tasting these wines and comparing them because if you think about it this way, if you go uh, into a room and hear a note from a piano, you know, you like that note. Next week you come in and you hear another note and you like that note, but you can't tell the difference. You can't, you don't know which one you liked better because you didn't, weren't doing it in real time. So I think that's what's uh, important and wonderful about comparing and having comparative tastings. Um, I've been lucky to do that for a long time and it really does uh, sharpen what you like and, and uh, it's a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and uh, to just to, uh, expound on that, it not only is it sharpen what you like, it helps you know what you don't like. Yeah. Which, you know, in wine is, you know, part of the battle too. You just want to eliminate all those things you don't like. And a lot of times you get there by just tasting side by side. Yeah. So uh, can I ask a question, Ed? Certainly. Yeah. So my question would be, I guess, if Napoleon did the classification on the left bank in the mid-19th century, the monks did the Burgundian classification in what, the 12th century? Yeah. Uh, the, the monks, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah no, 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 it came much later in Burgundy, much later. Much uh, later? Uh, yeah, than the 12th century. But um, I can't remember exactly when the Appalachian controlling laws in Burgundy Post-French Revolution, wasn't it? Was it? Was it? Oh, yeah. definitely post-post-French Revolution, but it, it yeah. could have been. It that probably was in the 1900s. So the, the plots. I guess they laid out the plots, and most of the Grand Crus are as they were laid out by the monks in those days. I guess I, the basic question was, uh, who got it closer to right? Because not much has changed in, other, in either area. No, it, you're really right. That's a great question. You know, the difference in Burgundy is that you can talk about a great vineyard that is, was laid out by the monks, as you said, and it had a, is a Grand Cru um, Burgundy. But that Grand Cru Burgundy vineyard is divided up into 50 different pieces. Yeah. And so Joe's wine is awful. Bob's wine is fantastic. It's the same vineyard. So it really makes it complicated. Um, it, both both Burgundy and Bordeaux are wonderful intellectual right. challenges. With with Burgundy probably being the most complicated and difficult. Yeah, yeah. yeah that that night we talked about we, when we did our uh, uh, Burgundy tasting. Uh, you know, we pointed out that something like Claude Rougeau has more than eighty uh, different owners that own vineyards in one. Pretty much uh, agree. Clermont. So um, it's just it's a it's super complicated uh and you know they have to it's just hard for them to um pull together that's why they work with these negotiants to you know have so they have enough product to to bring wine to market but it's a it's it's pretty complex like, i think I, to me both both are for their own individual reasons but that's what makes them so fun uh to learn you know to study is that history and terroir okay caroline caroline go ahead well, I just wanted to know if you know, if you can give us a little preview of the next two weeks. Mm -hmm. You know, I hate to confess that, I'm, um, you know, this is a brand new thing for me. And so I'm making them up about as I go. Um, <laughs> but but I, want, I do want to comment, Caroline, and thank you for asking. We've had a lot of great suggestions, like a, a red and white uh, to, together, um, a pairing tasting and uh, several other very good suggestions. So I am going to be relying on the suggestions that we got to, for, for the most part. And uh, next week's, I haven't decided yet uh, what we're going to do. It's, a, it's an ed talk. Um, and, uh, but I'm thinking, actually, about next week might, might be uh, an overview of Italy. Hmm. Uh, so um, that, that, that's kind of, and I, we will. We, 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 Tempranillo. Who, Eddie? Who is that? This is Susan Island, Eddie. Can you hear me? I can see you and hear you. Okay. I, well, can, see you, I can see you better because of the contacts you gave me. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, I was going to say, uh, I wanted to second Barbara's comments about how we all have different taste buds and what may taste good to one person may not taste the same to another. So you have to depend on what tastes good to you. Absolutely. Second, 
the second thing I want to say is I'm so thankful that you have opened your store and brought fine wines back to Birmingham and, and the, the people you've hired and the service you've given is something that we've missed for a while and we're so grateful to have again. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. We've, uh, we, we started drinking wine 40 years ago and have, are still just enjoying learning about it and everybody has their own different tastes. Uh, we happen to be uh, Merlot lovers and um, so we're, we're grateful to see that. We've, we've got a collection of the, uh, the French Bordeaux and it's interesting looking at the breakdown with Merlot and Cabernet as to how our collection, how our tastes fall into that range. Mm -hmm. But it's great to have this talk to just kind of educate people and bring them in and just help them to enjoy it. And thank you so much for doing that. Well, thank you so much for saying that. But it's an education for, all, for Thirsty and myself and all of us that we're just all all learning together. It's the only way you can do it. And um, we, we appreciate so much your support and everybody else's, you know, appreciate everybody being on, on tonight. And, you know, um, it was a very uh, bit of a struggle to meet this demand. And as I say, we had to turn down about 20 people. Um, we'll be more prepared next time and, um, and, and have plenty of wine on hand. Um, but, I, but by the way, um, it, uh, the, as uh, Carol Ann and Joy um, uh, uh, demonstrated for us, um, passing the word along was really helpful to Finch Fine Wines, and we appreciate you doing that. Please go ahead and keep that up. Tell everybody you know. That's the best recommendation, you know, is if you hear it from somebody you know. Is it, is well, it? Ed, we were going to you say, <laughs> I was going to say pre-coronavirus, um, post-coronavirus, this is a great format. I, I don't know if you were doing this before. We're we're newbies comparatively well, speaking, but what a what a great thing that's happening. This is a really nice thing. The the coronavirus is what triggered us to do it. Absolutely. You know, which it was our response to the virus. Well this is much better than sitting home looking at each other all night. You know? <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll, I'll throw this in. Um, I, I did the same thing. Um, I started, I launched a series of virtual wine tastings uh, six weeks ago as well. And it was really because a number of my clients were starting to cancel their in-person events and we wanted to try it uh, virtually. And um, it was such, people would just love to come together and learn, but also have that conviviality of seeing people and being able to to uh, enjoy wine and then you know Ed and I talked through uh, the the structure of what uh, something for Finch Fine Wines would look like and I think uh, I know he's received the same feedback I know from the folks that attend uh, my virtual uh, wine events they they don't want to see these stop even after um, we're able to get out and 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 uh, they, they like the idea of coming together and and uh, using these kinds of events, they may go out later and or whatever. But uh, I think um, the the uh, the whole concept of of of, of virtual wine tastings uh, is is maybe something that's sticking around for a while. Ed, Ed and Scott, the, I'll tell you, we've got uh, we have three kids under the age of ten. Oh, and, uh, <laughs> you get a special discount at the shop. That's right. That's right. <laughs> And you know, I would I would love to see these continue after the quarantine's over because it's a lot. It's very easy for us to grab a couple of bottles and sit down and and join everybody this way. It's a little bit more tedious to try to make it into the store every time. Certainly, I hadn't yeah. thought of that. We, we, thank you. Probably cheaper than a babysitter. <laughs> Much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's always uh, always easier to enjoy and buy wine when you have context, and that's one of the wonderful things about these virtual wine tastings is they give context to wines that you may have otherwise maybe been nervous about buying, or you know you want to learn a little bit more about it. But it it really helps. Um, it helps, and and then of course your ability to get curbside pickup there at at, at the wine shop. It's I mean gee whiz, who wants to go back to the other way? This is pretty great. Well, um, 
It's about eight fifteen, and and I'm I I am, and I think even uh, Scott's willing to stay on for a little bit, but we oh, don't yeah. want yeah. anybody to feel like they they have to. <laughs> Um, but I would like to go through, I can see several people, I, I, I'd like to go through and, and uh, poll everybody to see which one they liked the best. Uh, could, we, could we do that? And, and Sarah, can you, uh, can you see everybody enough to do that? I don't know whether you can or not. Uh, okay. All right. Great idea. Okay. So Sarah's going to put it in the chat. Y'all tell, um, tell us what you think is the best one. We'll report to you. Uh, you know, tomorrow about it, uh, what the what the verdict was. You also will be getting uh, uh, copies of the slides, so you'll know about the 1855 classification and the uh, you know, have the maps of of, uh, of Bordeaux. We're working we're, we're working on having uh, audio available uh, down the road, and we're going to put put them on YouTube so you can see them as well later on. Uh, so um, uh, that that's just something for you to know. But anybody have a special favorite? Um, where's Bill Bryant? Are you on here somewhere still? Bill Bryant? Not. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, somebody else, tell me, what was your favorite one? Christopher, where are you? There you are. Christopher, what'd you think? What was your favorite one? Hold on. <laughs> okay, I'm unmuted. Uh, <laughs> The Bernadotte. I, I was joking earlier. I, I said, "Don't tell Wendy," but I, I like him older. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I think the age and it softened the flav flavors in the wine. The um, we also had the uh, Fougere, the the twenty sixteen, and it's it's beautiful as well. But I I think it needs a little time. Uh, they all do. We just we'll have them tomorrow night, right? Yeah, even more time, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, Christopher, I'm going to answer that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I meant wine, Wendy, wine. I'm talking wine, too. No, I absolutely <laughs> agree. Bernadotte is singing tonight. It is absolutely it's singing. It's only 10 years old, but still, it, it's absolutely beautiful. And we have that one and the uh, uh, Fougere, but the, but the Bernadotte is singing. Yeah, and Wendy, just, just as a side note, I did, as soon as I got home from the shop after I saw you about, I don't know, it was about one o'clock, um, yeah. I decanted them then. So yep. they have been open a while. Good. It, good. Made a, it made a difference. And that's an Ed thing. That all came from Ed. So, so, so Christopher, do you get a little smokiness on the burn it up? I, I get a little smokiness with that, yeah. with that, with that black fruit really, that I really think is wonderful. I really liked Wendy's uh, cocoa reference. Cocoa, yes, would yeah. be good. Wendy's got that great. dry tannin kind of brings that out. Mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. Wendy's got great descriptions all the time. <laughs> yeah, this is the Bradford's calling. We have a split vote here. Um, Lynn and James prefer the Bernadotte, and the UVA law student preferred the Fougere. Ah, well, she's, she's young. She likes the young stuff. There yeah. you go. <laughs> Today online, but, but that's just the sophistication that comes with going to UVA. I gotta say, that is true. That is true. Okay, we let's see. Somebody else got a comment, please. Well, um, okay, I do. I actually, my favorite Bordeaux of the whole Bordeaux tasting is this one. Whoops, I don't know if you can see it, and I probably can't pronounce it, but it's Front Font Fontestu. It was oh. actually in your original tasting for the Bordeaux, which we didn't have because the COVID virus hit that week. Oh, wow. I, I came by and I picked up several of the bottles. And this one is the slam dunk. That's the one I love. I went back and bought two more. So What, what vintage is it, Barbara? Um, 2015. Wow. You know, uh, we had to cancel that Bordeaux tasting because the woman who was going to give it uh, got quarantined in France. Um, yeah, she had to go, she was actually here, but she had to, they made her go home. And, um, so we're going to have that tasting sometime. And depending on what happens with the virus, we may just do it as an, at a, as an interactive, uh, uh, tasting with her from France. We're working on that and that could happen very soon. Hope we hope it will. Ed, I, I'm just 
blown away by how much the burn dot has has changed. changed. I mean, we yeah. became it an hour before the um, before the tasting began, and even since we started tasting, even since the tasting started, it's just changed incredibly. I agree, absolutely, just getting better and better and better. It's just that's what Bordeaux does, and 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 they get better for tw for twenty years sometimes or or yeah. more. Um, uh, my daughter Jessica may be on here somewhere. Maybe she she, she would probably be muted. Muted. She's kind of a shy person, but her birth year is eighty two, and so uh, we we have been drinking eighty two Bordeaux and still have several more left for her birth years. And Maida has is seventy five, which was kind of a hard year. But the good news is it finally softened up about three or four years ago. And uh, but Bordeaux is like that. I mean, seventy five Bordeaux did not get drinkable until. I don't know, 10 years ago at the earliest. Um, that's, that's what happens with it. Somebody else had something to say or offer. Come on. Uh, James Cooper wants to know when the, when's the trip? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we knew that was coming. Well, we'll we're, we're working on trips, but we'll have to get <laughs> on quarantine first. <laughs> We've got to get Europe on quarantine. Yeah, no kidding. But it will be a good time to go to Europe sometime. Yeah, it sure will. Soon. There ought to be some pretty good bargains. I have, I have a story. Great. A confession. Love story. I have a confession. Love confession. It's good for the yes, soul. My husband bought the two wines for tonight and put them in the wine fridge. They weren't in the cellar in the basement. But one night, um, probably he had gone to sleep Tuesday night, and I thought, oh, I want a little more wine. I accidentally opened the Bernadette, Bern, Bernadotte. Yep. Mm -hmm. I opened that one. Yep. And it was good, but I yep. didn't think of it as anything super special. Yep. But tonight, it is my favorite one. So it has held up just sitting in our wine fridge since Tuesday. Wow. Yep. <laughs> and I was so worried, oh no, it's going to be bad by the time we taste it and he's going to be upset with me, but. Well, you, you just, you make the point and that, and that is the point. Bordeaux, <laughs> good, good red wine will do that. I had a 2006 uh, wine from Spain recently um, uh, from Ribera de Duero. De Duero. And um, I, we had some people over and uh, they turned out they wanted white wine. I'd already opened up the, uh, the Spanish wine and decanted it and they, they all wanted white wine. And so I had a little bit of the red and put it in the refrigerator and I forgot about it for a couple of days. And I just had some last night and it was terrific. It was better than, better than it was the night that I opened it. Just, that's, that's what happens. Hey, your guests probably decided they all wanted white wine because they did not want a chance spilling red wine on your furniture <laughs> or floor. <laughs> well, that, is, that would be a, a risk, but um, we were outside. We were having a socially distant uh, oh. <laughs> uh, 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 cocktail. We, had, we, have, we can sit on our little terrace and be six feet apart from people and still be you know, close enough to talk. So that was, it worked. Good. But how soon will you be able to, uh, are you open? I, I, I guess you can sell wine and so on, but how is this city of Birmingham actually, and all the, that uh, impacting? Actually, we've been declared an essential business for obvious reasons. You know, <laughs> the, the, uh, the, the government authorities in, all over the world have figured out if they, if they shut down alcohol, they'll be deposed. So um, they've all been very careful to, uh, to make sure that um, they don't uh, do that. So we're an essential service. You can come in anytime you want to. Our, our folks will be gloved and masked and uh, we're using disinfectants every day. And, and um, so you can come in to our shop and buy wines or you can uh, call us and, and tell us you'd like to get some wine and we'll take it out to you. Or you can send us an email or you can buy online and, and really, over time, you, you need to get uh, registered with us, and that's different from us having your email. Registered is uh, where you can go online and buy 
actually buy from our um, online inventory, uh, which over time, the people who are registered will be getting some long-term benefits. We'll have kind of a wine club uh, aspect where you get first call on things and, and so on. So registering with, with Finch Fine Wines, which uh, is, is a requirement really of the ABC laws, um, is something we, we encourage you to do uh, when you can because it's over time that's going to become a real benefit to those people who have done so. Very good. We need a discount for Betty Ford Clinic too, you know, after all this. <laughs> We have an arrangement with them about that. If we, you just tell them, you know, you don't, you know, Finch Fine Wines, and you're in. Yeah, but just think how low your cholesterol numbers will be. Yeah, that's right. Your heart doctor will hate us. There's, yeah. a, there's a positive and every negative. There, you know. Hey, Ed. Yes, ma'am. I am. Uh, I'm. My name is Biba. I'm over here enjoying both of these delicious wines. You, you over, you, you're over where? I'm sorry. I'm over here with my dad. Oh, okay. We're, we're both enjoying these wonderful fine wines, and I thought it worth mentioning, my mother made a batch of homemade I brownies. I love these In case anybody was wondering what a good pair. I sorry, that's my kid. A good wine pairing would be with the Bernadotte chocolate brownies. Oh, yes. oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Bordeaux likes uh, chocolate pr pretty well. There's some other wines. There's some other wines that are great with chocolate uh, too. And, and sometimes we'll have a chocolate <laughs> and wine di discussion. It's just it's, it goes well. Yep. Mr. Finch. Yes, ma'am. Who? Where? Uh, Christopher, sort of. Oh, I'm but, I'm Carrie. Um, not not not, not not Mr. Finch. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm known Christian. Hey, Ed. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> I just wanted to say that this is incredible and amazing and so ingenious. I put that on the chat, but Christopher said nobody's going to believe that it came from him. So I thought the Bernadotte was really, really lovely, but I like the um, Fougere. Fougere 2016. Um, but I will take some of Daughter Croft's chocolate brownies next time. And I love watching all of these people and their facial expressions. And uh, cheers. Well, thank you very much. And thank cheers you. To you. You were the great Indeed. guy. Known him for a, since he was a baby. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, is your, this is your neighbor, James Bradford. Bless your heart, Ed. <laughs> Ed, this is your neighbor, James Bradford. Yes, you can have the key to the cellar. <laughs> well, this, thank you. Uh, this has been such a treat to taste these two fabulous wines and go to Italy next week. And I, I want, with your great fan base on here, I suggested early on that the name of the business should be Ed's Wine World to compete with Ed's Pet World. But I think Ed's uh, Finch's Fine Wine is still uh, <laughs> a better way to do it. But I, mm. I just, I'm so grateful for you for doing this, Ed, and for Wendy and for Todd and the whole team. Thank you so much. Thank you, and I'm, I'm, I wanted to apologize for you for rejecting your suggestion, but it, the, the team thought it was probably not a good idea. Um, you know, if if you're going to give him the key because he's your neighbor, I'm your neighbor. <laughs> right. Well, come on over. We'll have a little party. Hey, um, the address. <laughs> I, I think yeah. I just. Carol, uh, Johnny's yeah. asking for the key. We're, we're your neighbor, too. <laughs> you know, when you have some wine in your cellar, you get a lot of neighbors. <laughs> have good friends. Sesame Street. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. James Childs, are you still on here? James, James Childs is a partner in Finch Fine Wines. What, James, are you there? I'm here. Good. How are you doing tonight? I'm really enjoying this Bernadotte, which is getting better every 15 minutes. It really it, it has improved, hasn't it? It has. It really has. It's, it's wonderful. Now, I need you to go back to work and work on our deal. Would you do that, please? <laughs> I'll do that first thing tomorrow morning, Ed. <laughs> James is the best lawyer in the United States, uh, just about. He, he and Bill Bryant, who is also a partner. Uh, the two best in Birmingham for sure. <laughs> Good men. 
Brad Higginbotham, you've been quiet as you always are. How are you and your lovely wife doing? You have something you hey, want to tell us? Hey, how are you? Good. We're good. Good. What is um? There's something so earthy about the Bernadotte that's like the it changes. You know, like it right now to me, it smells like that first um, smell of a rose. Like when you first smell a rose, like that mm -hmm. musky smell. You know, it's just wonderful. Great description. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think the 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 what well, the the other one the 2015. So we had Froger. Yeah. yeah. Well, you use a you know French. Uh, uh, it, at first, like that's what it's going to be. I think for tonight anyway. We we open them up at four thirty. Good. Um, four thirty. Like yeah. You 4 say 4 Good for you. And then because um, I picked them at the store like at four o'clock, I think, and um, um, it opened up. I mean, it's it's, it's fine, but it's going to be like this. I think slowly opening up, but definitely the Bernardo is evolved, like everybody says. But the other one. That's what's going to be, and it was good at first. So if you asked me at seven o'clock which one I liked, it would have been uh, the right bank. Mm -hmm. But but now I, I mean I really I mean the Bernardo, like everybody says. But I mean it's funny how that switched was that I liked the other one first, but it's not obviously not bad. But yeah, anyway. We love it, Ed. This is so great. Well, thank you for being on. We appreciate you very much. Do it forever. Maggie's bedtime is at seven, so this is great for us. We put her to bed, and then we get we, we drink wine. Well, of course, we picked the time from a survey, and, um, and and by the way, you'll get a survey, of course, after this. And please fill it out and give us your suggestions. What we there, we've got a backlog of, of topics to talk about as a result of that, and and improvements to make. We we you know, this is kind of amateur hour, and I apologize for that, but it's. Um, Please uh, help us out by telling us what we can do better and um, uh, and what you liked and what you didn't like. We love it. We want to do it forever. <laughs> well, I'll try. Yay! <laughs> um, all right. I think we've probably worn everybody out. So um, thank you very much for being on. I appreciate it. Uh, Carol Ann and Joy, thank you very much for helping us had such a great, uh, great event this time. We appreciate it. Good night. Thanks, Ed. Good night. Bye-bye. Au revoir.